Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm Kay Bizzles. I'm a critic and editor of Representology, which is the journal for media and diversity. I'm delighted to be joined by Joanna Abayi, who is the head of creative diversity at the BBC, who also works with the all-party parliamentary group on creative diversity. Uh, we have Lucy Pilkington, the founder and CEO of Milk and Honey Productions. We have Marcus Ryder, the head of external consultancies at the Lenny Henry Centre for Media and Diversity and chair of RADA. We have Shaminda Nahal, who is the head of specialist factual programming at Channel 4. And at the end, we have Miranda Wayland, who is the head of international DEIA content and strategy for Amazon Studios and Prime Video. And Miranda was previously head of creative diversity at the BBC. Now, Joanna, I thought we'd start with you. Um, I was hoping you may be able to give the audience an explainer on the BBC's Diversity Fund. Now, this is a fund with over £100 million that has been pledged for diverse and inclusive content. Uh, do programmes like Caribbean Britain relate in any way to the fund? So, it's not a fund. <laughs> That's the first thing to make really, really clear. It's, uh, it's basically a floor, of, if you like, of, if you like sorry, of investment of the existing commissioning spend that our genres have. So ultimately what we're saying in this um, commitment, in this investment, is that at least £112 million across our television and radio should be spent uh, meeting three criteria. So the launch of this investment obviously um, happened following the death of George Floyd, but was before my role, before I became permanent. And so it started in June 2020, and that was the response directly to that. And so, yeah, it's not a fund. It's, it's just the way, it's kind of the best way maybe to look at it is thinking about it as a, a bit of an accounting tool as to how to look at how we spend um, our commissioning budget. Do you feel that the BBC and the UK TV industry in general has shifted in the right direction over the last three years to cater for black audiences? Um, I think there's always, always going to be um, space and opportunity to do better and to cater more and more and more, especially with nuanced portrayal and opportunities for people off screen. We're always going to... I don't... I think everyone agrees that we could continue to do that work. I think what the 112 million investment has done as it has got people within the BBC thinking about what stories they're telling and the portrayal and the authenticity of those stories. It's got them thinking about who they're working with from an external perspective. And I think it's done the same for the suppliers and indies that we work with. They're thinking about how diverse are our production teams. So, I mean, I think it's made progress, and we know that because of some of the numbers that came out of last year when we reported on this. Um, but I don't by any means think that this is the only way and that we've absolutely hit the jackpot. We've definitely got opportunities to pro progress more positively. Fabulous. Um, Lucy, now, as the owner and founder of a black-led production company, do you feel that networks have offered organisations like yours sufficient help and support in order to win commissions? Um, uh, can I just say, that, you know, the, the reason why this whole process started was because mm -hmm a black man lost his life in really tragic circumstances. And I think sometimes we, we forget that this is a response to how can this happen in America in, our, in this day and age, and we are responding to the fact that there are black lives that are, you know, come to tragic ends. So, you know, because sometimes people go, oh, well, you know, has, how has it, how's it worked for us black creatives? And it's like, well you know, in a way, we are tasked with a job, which is to tell the stories of the people that can't tell their stories. So, so that's really important. So, do, you know, do I think um, after um, the, the tragic murder of George Floyd, we got more work? Yes, of course we did. You know, my phone was ringing, you know, sort of <coughs> obscenely quickly <laughs> after it. And, 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 and lots of other um, black program makers would say the same thing. Um, and, and because, you know, there is a duty to go, how is, you know, why is, why, how have we got here? You know, and I think there was, there's been a long drift away from caring about 
you know, minority people, black people, <coughs> politics, that suddenly we're sort of trying to redress. So I think in the short term, of course, you know, lots of black producers are working who weren't working probably a few years ago. But I think we should sort of think about that in the context of, you know, why are we working? What are we trying to achieve? <coughs> and are we moving in that direction? If that makes sense. Now, if we move on to Shaminda, Ch Channel 4 was one of the first large media organisations to uh, offer a public commitment to anti-racism. And the channel received many plaudits for its Black to Front Day in September 2021. What do you feel its successes were? And do you think there's a legacy in the television industry? Well... I mean, I, I think what Lucy said is such a brilliant way of putting it, and it's, I'm just thinking, I don't know how many of you saw any of Black to Front, but it was born out of that very raw, painful moment that Lucy's describing. And I think what happened was that myself and some of my colleagues at Channel 4 felt, I mean, like a lot of people around the world and in our country just felt like we have to do more than just keep talking about terrible things that are happening and try and, you know, do something more lasting. And we work with our sort of bosses to try and think about what we could do. Um, my colleague Viv, Vivian Maloku, who's a, um, also a commissioning editor, we, she always said, you know, we want to take some big steps, stop taking these kind of little steps and actually try and do something. So we were trying to think about kind of something of scale, you know, something genuinely impactful and something that had legacy. And so the idea was to sort of force people to think about what was happening and to reimagine our channel's output for a sort of a, a period of a, a concise period of 24 hours. It was always meant to be more than a day. But what we did and what I think when I reflect on it did feel powerful Obviously, it was in a limited form, and it was criticised by some people, as well as praised by some people. Um, we reinvented all our usual programmes, our usual schedule, with, um, but with black talent and black contributors and with black teams making the programmes by and large. Um, the thing that was sort of amazing to me was that our sort of ad and marketing team worked with us and so all the adverts were black as well and so it did feel like what I'd always hoped was that it felt like for a little bit you'd have that feeling of say watching Black Panther for the first time where you saw a superhero movie sort of reimagined it was just allowing us to sort of shift the dial a little bit and imagine something a little bit different and then where does that take you and it touches on something quite important for me which is the sort of the editorial content. So again, to what Lucy was talking about and what everyone's always talking about, is that it was born out of something terribly traumatic. But how do we both tackle those things, but also try and find a way of talking about black lives and realities and stories that are everything else, that are normal, that are pleasurable, that are funny, that are joyful. So there's that bit of tension in the, what the content is. And then there's also the machinery of how we make our program and how our industry works. And we did a number of things that we're still working on, and it's a very long road, but some actual practical things that we tried to change, tried to introduce that we can talk about a bit later. And I should say that one of the really brilliant parts of the whole project was that Marcus helped give us some advice and thoughts and input on it. And, you know, obviously never short of, of criticisms, but that was what was so brilliant. Because we needed to have, we needed to be working all the time and challenging ourselves and never be complacent. And I think that is the only way that we're going to, you know, actually try and make a difference. But I won't go on because I'm actually much more interested in hearing what Miranda was going to say. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe we can first move on to, to Marcus and talk about that work that you, you uh, have done with Channel 4. I mean, you know that last year was the 40th anniversary of the founding of Channel 4, which was founded in a spirit of radicalism. There may be a, uh, an apocryphal story whereby the first commissioner at Channel 4, Jeremy Isaacs, meets the chairman of the Conservative Party, Norman Tebbit, uh, and saying, look, we're catering for minority interest, just like you expected. And Norman Tebbit goes, by minority interest, I mean golf and fishing <laughs> and sailing, rather than, you know, minorities, as it were. Um, so wh what, what are your thoughts on the kind of setup or radical ethos of Channel 4 and whether 40 years on we still have that in play? Um, 
So I think that Channel 4 was set up with a very clear remit, and that remit was relaxed in 2003 under the Communications Act and the um, setup of Ofcom, and a lot of its license requirements where it had to meet um, not just diversity, but it had to meet um, education programs, it had to meet lots of different requirements, and that was massively reduced. So I think the, channel, the radical Channel 4 that we often think about, which is its 80s and 90s heritage, is not the Channel 4 that we know today. And that's no shade on the... God, I sound like a kid. That's, you know, that's, that's no criticism... Um, of the people, of the, of the people, of, of the people next sitting next to me, right? <laughs> but, as radical as who, is, who is <laughs> radical as they come. Pathetic. But the but the reality is that whatever broadcaster you're in, you're working to the license requirements and you're working to the structures which are set down by the regulator. And the people working in Channel Four are working to different regulations than they were um, before 2003. And I would advise Ofcom or DCMS or together, to relook at that remit, because I think that when, when Channel 4 was actually under threat of privatization, a lot of the times when they were talking about why they were great, they were going back and, uh, and referencing the brilliant things they did before 2003. And in many ways, they found their edge, they found their courage, they found their boldness, again, to justify their existence. Otherwise, Channel 4 could very quickly Become, but this is all the stuff which I was talking about when privatisation was on. So, to get back to the black squares very quickly, right? As well as back to front day, Channel 4, you are absolutely right. Channel 4 is the first people to come out with a statement. That's fabulous. They had a six point plan, and we should look at their six point plan because a lot of the time people put out these things and then don't revisit what they did. So, Channel 4, six point plan, it will be anti racist, right? We commit to being an anti racist organisation. We are wholeheartedly committed to being an anti racist organisation, right? Now, there are ways in which it can be an anti-racist organisation. BEC2 has proposed that there should be a racism monitoring, um, uh, independent racism monitoring organisation because Channel 4 and other broadcasters say that they think there's under-reporting of racist incidents. So if Channel 4 really wants to be anti-racist, I would suggest that they actually sign up to it. The things which they committed to seemed non-measurable as to how you'd be an anti-racist organisation at best. Point two, our staff will commit to strive for BME equity as an employer. We are committed to the target of 20% of Channel 4 staff and 20% of top 100 paid staff will be BME by 2023. They haven't reached there, it's 2023. But what's interesting is that that commitment was the same commitment that they had before George Floyd's death. So that's not really a commitment, right? Um, point three, our content. We commit to commissioning relevant and... Sorry I'm, uh, sorry, I'm like going on, but I think it's really important, right, that if people put out statements, if organisations put out statements, they need to be able to revisit them. And what was really good about Channel 4, working with the Lenny Henry Centre, is that we did work with them with Black to Front, and then they, a year later they, they came back to us and said, how did we do? And I think that, and that's a brilliant example of how you actually work with an organisation. You, you do something, and then a year later you assess it, and a year later you assess it, and a year later you assess it, because, you know, the impact is, and Channel 4 was really good at doing that, Right? They haven't gone back, to the, as far as I'm aware, to this commitment. Point three, our content will commit to commissioning relevant and authentic content that reflects the lives of BME audiences in an ongoing basis. Again, no real strict um, uh, KPIs of how they should do that. Now, Beats, which is the British East Asian and Theatre and Screen, have put out what's the equivalent of a Bechdel-Wallace test. You know, people know Bechdel-Wallace tests? About, um, and so they've put that out equivalent. What would be really useful is if um, Channel 4 or the broadcasters got together and put out a Bechdel Wallace test for ethnicity, for authenticity, because they talk about this authenticity, but it's just kind of in the ether. There are ways in which you can actually put a KPI to measure your authenticity. That doesn't mean that every representation of women in film have to pass a Bechdel Wallace test for it to be a good representative of women, but it's a useful way of actually measuring it. Okay? So that's point three. They haven't actually put anything to that. Point four, our face, we commit to fair representation of BME's representation on screen. That's kind of the same as before. Supply chain, we commit to fair BME representation in our supply chain. That's really useful. I think that Black to Front Day actually went a long way with regards to looking at that supply chain. 
And so we can, they can keep on building on that. They didn't actually put, um, we are committed to 50% of our remaining commission's development spend in 2020 being from BME-led nations and regions of small indies. That was just for one year. It would be really good if they could actually say what that commitment was going on longer as opposed to that one commitment. Our business model, we commit to use our influence as an advertiser-funded broadcast to ensure BME representation in advertising. Our one million diversity in advertising award for 2020 will be focused on BME representation within advertising. That's wonderful. I don't know what it was whether it's still focused on BME in 2021 or 2022 or 2023. I, I honestly don't know. Right? And so we just need to make sure that if there are those commitments, we are just transparent and, and open. It's only because you asked me about Channel 4. But I'm more than happy to talk about BBC. Well, yes. And, <laughs> right? Right. and I'm sure we'll get onto that later. We will get onto that. And we, sh we should probably say that both... BBC and ITV have a kind other of rich. <laughs> they have a rich heritage. Throughout the 70s and 80s of putting black content on ITV and BBC. But can I just say, yeah. can I just briefly say, yes, not because I desperately do think Miranda yeah. has much more to say, but just to answer a little bit of that. that I, d I think that is so brilliant and it is actually a really good lesson to... The, I think the coming back point is really important and I think it's to keep that's what I was trying to say that we appreciate the challenge and the scrutiny and that's really important the important thing is that we keep thinking about this stuff and analysing it and detailing it and coming back to it and looking at the results and we can talk later when we get onto details lots of that stuff we are addressing and are looking at how to quantify when we set targets what should they be how stretching etc how do we measure everything I would just say though that one thing, not everything can be measured, and a lot of the things that we're talking about in culture change is it's a something that you can't quite put your finger on, but when it's starting to move and there's a bit of momentum, you can feel it a little bit. And I think so some of the things in the culture isn't perfectly measured, but also some of the stuff in our content and our st storytelling isn't perfectly able to be measured in terms of just numbers, that's all I'm saying. We need the numbers and we'll we need Miranda the... talk yeah. before I retort, before I respond to <laughs> okay. Because I, I do think that, you know, we'll never get to Miranda. But I'm, not, I'm not sure it's as straightforward as that. Yes, we are going to turn to Miranda. I'm good. I am good just letting this play out. I am all manners are good. He really likes Channel 4. It's I do like Channel 4. favourite programme. I, I, did, I did want to ask, in the sort of... Um, and it, it bounces off uh, Lucy's point earlier, but the spark for this conversation is very much a political and social spark. And I feel as an observer that the legacy of George Floyd's murder has been taken altogether more seriously in America than it has in Britain on a governmental level. You have President Biden coming out and acknowledging systemic racism in all aspects of American society. Whereas in Britain, we released, the government released the Sewell Report which uh, <laughs> criticised the idealism <laughs> of people who claim that the country is institutionally racist, uh, believes that the sl slave trade was not all bad, as <laughs> culturally African people transformed themselves. Um, now, that was a government report that came out at the same time as the Biden statement. So, I would like to go to Miranda in terms of the television industry. What do you feel internationally is the legacy <laughs> of the black square? I'm going to take us back 24 hours before the killing of George Floyd and just remind everybody that there were black creatives and content makers and consumers who were black who were either trying to break into the industry, wanted to see themselves reflected authentically, and then George Floyd got killed and the rest of the world woke up and went, oh my God, there's racism. <laughs> so that's what happened. And then in the midst of that, the entire industry, UK International, started to do a deep dive in the portfolio of content they had to establish whether or not some of the content were outdated, spoke to narratives and, and stereotypes and tropes that were no longer acceptable, were still sitting on their, their content portfolio, and then started to try and make themselves accountable. Like, what are we really doing? We now need to be looking to be on the right side of the argument. There is a commercial revenue stream in that, in suddenly understanding that actually there is a wealth of talent uh, an audience base that perhaps you haven't been serving properly, and we consider them to be historically excluded groups. And I think what you started to see, to Lucy's point, is that everybody's door started to be knocked if you happen to have some melanin in your skin. 
um, as if you didn't exist before. So for me, that's really encouraging, but it shouldn't need someone to die in the middle of a pandemic for us to know something that most of us have been experiencing and living for decades. So once you start to reset that kind of comprehensive understanding that there is a consumer base out there that wants to see some authentic stories that isn't baked in trauma, that actually there is black love and there's beautiful stories that can be told from different lenses and different uh, perspectives, then have you got the right infrastructure to support them? Because suddenly we're farming out and commissioning content to people left, right and center, and then, and then putting a different metrics to success. We want to be measured and we want to be a part of the conversation like everybody else, not as a default that something's gone wrong and suddenly the torchlight is on us and we want to see it. So I think that's what happened globally. From an Amazon perspective, and bearing in mind I've only been there a year, 16th of May makes a year. Uh, so I don't know everything that I should know, but I can tell you that they expanded into Africa to be able to create uh, a portfolio of content and invest in local uh, talent. And that just recently gave us the Gangs of Lagos in terms of our, our first movie, uh, local, local Original. Uh, we also doubled down on a lot of US content. So hopefully you would have seen on our streaming service things like One Night in Miami, um, you know, Harlem, lots of beautiful stories that whilst feels like it's a journey that we're all familiar with, our customers hadn't seen black stories in that way. They had to be educated to understand what the black experience is. I think the financial investment has grown exponentially in terms of who has the capital wealth to be making those stories and not just in the hands of people who don't come from those backgrounds. So that's been really empowering. Again, the, our executive commissioning portfolio needs to change. And I think that's true across the globe where we are actually seeing people who look like us making uh, editorial decisions about stories that represent us. And I think, you know, we'd all agree, irrespective of what part of the world you live in, you would want to see that. And you'd also want us to have the opportunity to tell stories that don't relate to us. How many white production companies have been telling my stories for decades? I want to be able to tell you what you look like and I don't look like you. So I think there's been a balance of understanding about this being primary for us as a consumer. We're marching with our money, we're marching with our mouth, we're no longer putting up with microaggressions and, you know, I often sit in offices and kiss my teeth and go, yeah, that ain't happening. So, and in a place where I wouldn't have done that before because I'm worried about losing my job. That now feels like whilst it's still prevalent, we are still talking, not in corridors and in quiet places, but we're actually challenging what we're seeing. We're expecting better, and when we're not getting it, we're actually taking our money and paying for content elsewhere. And that's got to be empowering. And, and briefly, so um, because you obviously have this like wealth of experience in the UK as well as um, a year in the US, what would you say the kind of key difference between, say, working with a production company like Lucy's from an earlier stage would be transatlantically? So in my current role, I get to be involved right from the development stage, whereas I think previously my roles were more about mitigation, uh, about helping us to navigate some of those difficult territories. Um, I now get to sit right from the beginning, so getting to work with people like Lucy from the get-go and understanding, actually, is the, this the right story in terms of us as being a streamer, that we need to delight our customers and obsess over them. We're talking about racial equity, right, and we're understanding the financial rhythm that sits behind that and how we surface it. So we have an always on approach, i.e. we're not waiting for Black History Month for you to see black content. You can see it all the time, people. And hopefully most of you have got your Amazon Prime account sorted. So you can access it. Um, and then right through from you know, development to green light, we're having these really conscious, intentional conversations. Is it authentic in the storylines that we're telling? Are we setting it in the right environment? And actually, I'm looking at the schedule overall to determine if we are surfacing content that is baked in trauma, that that's not the only thing that our schedule has. And then we get into production and we're creating environments where psychologically being black can be challenging, right? So we want to create those psychological safe spaces that black talent can do their best work, not having to worry about their ethnicity and their identity while they're on set. Thanks, Miranda. Um, we're we're going to briefly watch a clip of uh, Get On Up, The Triumph of Black America, which Lucy, uh, Lucy's company was uh, um, in charge of. It was broadcast earlier this year. So maybe, Richard, if we can have the clip. 
watched your show engaged like I've never been engaged before. I think I went to bed and just wailed. I, I, mm. I, you know, it was deeply, deeply, deeply emotional. Did you immediately sense from the script that this, there was something special about this show? I was reading little excerpts from the character I ultimately portrayed, which was Kunta Kinte. And I said, man, whoever gets sad is going to be, mm. <laughs> that is going to be the bomb part, yeah. you know? Ultimately, they called me back and they said they'd like you to read for the role of Kunta Kinte. And I almost wept. I was so excited. No one had ever dealt with the issue of slavery in that depth before and showed these characters to be human beings who were suffering under the burden of slavery. So I had the opportunity to dispel so many myths. Mm. And there's a sort of rumored story that perhaps the studio may have been a little nervous <laughs> about about the material and that it was it was sort of rushed out and yeah. nobody sort of knew how it was going to land. No one knew what they had uh, until they they aired it and when they, and the network looked at it they said nobody's going to watch this thing. Let's get this out of the way. Get, you know, run all the episodes together consecutively and maybe people forget about it. Instead, the nation shut down. Wow. Now, I'd love the panel to have a broad discussion around the issue of whether black content sells. And maybe, Lucy, on the back of the clip that we've just seen, you may be able to start. Um, does black content sell? Well, I mean, I think it's very interesting because what he's actually describing is uh, white executives, which they mostly would have been in, in the 70s, deciding whether or not... A, a broadly white audience wants to watch black interiority. And I think that so, and we've all sat in those rooms where other people have made decisions about, you know, convoluted decisions about, do they want to watch this about black people? And I think, you know, the big change that is coming and has to come is that you need black executives. You know, we've got a few on this panel who are actually making those editorial decisions about what not only black people will watch, but what white people will watch. Because, you know, we've all been brought up, you know, around white people all the time. So we know what, whether or not white people are likely to watch this or that or the good story. So, so I think it's about, that's really about the buying. You know, do black stories get bought? And obviously, you know, this is what we're talking about now. But then do they sell? Do viewers come to them? I mean, that's what this whole series was about. Get On Up was about how African-American culture, which we all feed into African-American culture, you know, has basically dom dominates popular culture. And we end with Black Panther. So, of course, audiences will come to black stories. Of course, they will come to, to black heroes. Of course, they will come to all sorts of areas. But you've got to, in a way get behind it. You know, that's what the, the African-American creat creatives are saying. They're saying, absolutely, give me $100 million and I'll give you, you know, I'll give you a hit, you know. And that's, I think, where we need to, we need to have a bit more, you know, uh, a bit more confidence in, in black stories and, and being told from a black perspective, I think. And, and I'm sorry, can, uh, you said that there were black executives that made decisions on the panel. Oh. So we have to be very, very clear about that because it's a really important part of the discussion, I think. Yeah. So, so that's, a, that's, that's my only point. And maybe that's something we can touch upon in the, in the Q&A uh, later. We yeah, can, no, I can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can answer correct that. that. No, no, thank, thank you very much. Um, Miranda, going back to your point earlier mm. about the type of black experience that is portrayed on screen, do you feel that there is an emphasis on black trauma as, um, uh, as the sort of dominant experience of people of colour on screen? There, there can be. You know, there's an audience and an appetite, sadly, for that. And, and you know, I want to make sure that that's not the only thing that gets surfaced. Um, 
our job is to try to support and facilitate black content creators to come to us to tell their stories, for us to financially give them equity and parity so they can do that, but also make sure that as a consumer, that's not the only thing that I'm offering you. So I think, you know, whilst we recognise that there are aspects where black trauma sells, because that's a narrative that is very well understood, uh, for, for a number of consumers, it can't be the only narrative, which is why we're hoping to expand the portfolio and keep doing some of the work that we're doing. But, you know, I think I want to be able to work in an organization that has the breadth and the vision and innovation to be able to look much more dimensionally about who I am, because black is just one aspect of my identity. There are other components about me, which is equally interesting, and skill sets that couple that, that really helps to make that journey go forward. And I think every one of us on the panel either directly or indirectly have contributed to trying to open up the conversation. Um, and to be fair, you know, as we sit in different editorial experiences and, and situations where you're either championing from an editorial perspective about how a particular character is perceived when you make these particular cuts in an edit suite versus the type of language that's being used and the dialect that's being used, you're also thinking about, is this still an interesting piece? Because you want it to get recommissioned. You want to continue working with that production company. You want to bring other production companies in. And, you know, we've got to get to this point where one black-led production company does not continue to be the fallacy for all black production companies, right? Mm -hmm. This one-in-one-out thing that we still seem to be seeing, that needs to taper off. I think we've, we've done our... We've, we've been on a recruitment drive where you keep testing me to see if I'm any good. We finish now. Just hire. <laughs> and initiatives and schemes, we all understand the pathways to get into it. Look, Amazon's invested huge amounts of money in the American Black Film Festival. We just need to surface the content on our platforms. And that's what I think all consumers want, is the opportunity to see different stories told by those authentic storytellers uh, that makes it feel really enriched as an opportunity for why I'm investing in a streamer. Thanks. Um, Can I just respond to John T's point? Yes, brief, briefly. Right. So, briefly, in our discussions with Channel 4, with Black to Front, um, there were discussions as to whether we were talking about Black or whether we were talking about BAME. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there was utility in sometimes <coughs> having a collective noun. There is also utility in making sure that we are specific. And I think that if we're talking about um, uh, reactions to... So I think both things can be useful in their context, right? And uh, one of the problems with regards to the legacy of the um, uh, Black Square um, is that if you take, for example, the BBC statement... I told you I was going to get to BBC. Don't worry. Bring it on. Right? Bring if, it. If, if we got to the BBC statement about their £112 million fund... right? All the um, press releases about it when it was initially launched under Miranda. Um, <laughs> right. Right. Please show my friends. <laughs> it's like the Amazon. And, you know, I don't even know about the BBC. Right. Right. But yeah, just making sure that we know who's here. Right. Cool. Okay. Right. But just say, when that was launched, it was a lot of the literature, a lot of the PR material around it was about George Floyd's death. When you then looked at the criteria, it became BME, socioeconomic, and, uh, and disability, yeah. right? Now, I'm not saying that um, socioeconomic diversity isn't important. It is very important. Similarly, disability diversity is incredibly important. But if we are really, and similarly, Asian programs, and other non-white people are really important. But it was a concern, and I think it is a concern, that what was meant to be a response to anti-black racism quickly morphed. The BBC is an obvious example, but it was throughout broadcasters and throughout industries quickly morphed into a kind of more amorphous, kind of like, let's just address uh, prejudice and bigotry in general. Right, and so we just need to make sure that, um, if you buy my book, <laughs> that, that black lives matter. Right? And that's, that's what people were saying when they were marching on the streets. They weren't saying, you know, um, all prejudice is wrong. They were saying black lives matter. 
And so if there should be a legacy of the black square, it should be that black lives matter. I'd like to... I'd like to find out a bit more about the kind of internal shifts that may have taken place. And maybe, Shaminda, you can cast light on the outcomes of broadcasting black content within Channel 4. And then maybe we can go to Joanna and we can talk about... Um... <laughs> so, yeah, um, the, the, the outcomes within Channel 4. What have you seen take yeah. place? Gosh, I mean, there's so much. I was really impressed that when you were doing your BBC bit, you didn't have to refer to the iPad. Because it was all just, you know... When oh, you Marcus knows this inside I out. Know. I know. Mean, well, well, remember like that, years? Like, when you had to sort of put it on your iPad and then do the... <laughs> six-point the statement. <laughs> next time, I, I can next go time you need to learn it off by heart. So I, I can go through that when the BBC made regional commitment to Scotland, yeah. it was able to release an incredibly easy press release which said that it was £33 million is going to be invested into BBC Scotland's new digital channel, right? It was straightforward. It said that, and I'll have to refer to it now, right? <laughs> no, no, but seriously, this is... This, but this is the difference, right? The, the difference is that it was then able, in its press release, was able to say that 12, where £12 million of that money is coming from, and it was coming from existing money that was going to Scotland. It was then able to say that, that was already in Scotland, saying that additional money was going to be coming from other productions. Mm -hmm. right? And so at the end of it, after I'd read the BBC press release about Scotland, just trying to scan quickly through here, right? but it was basically saying, oh, here we go. Right? I, was I was able to figure out... or if, no, that BBC Scotland Division's existing budget for 90 million would have 90 million of additional funding. So I knew that the BBC was valuing Scottish programme makers by 19 million extra pounds a year. Right? It was really easy. I could not tell after the 100 million pound fund, right, which was over three years, whether the BBC was going to do £33 million of extra... It wasn't, it's not even black programming, you know, because it's disability and socioeconomic, right? So let's, let's get back to the black programming. I've got no idea whether the BBC, following its announcement, whether it values it black programming by £33 million a year? One pound a year? Nothing. I have no idea. Right? Grown-up conversations are where we talk about money. Right? And grown-up conversations, I, worked, I was head of country affairs at BBC Scotland for eight years, and what I, those grown-up conversations were had in Scotland constantly, as in, is more money going into Scotland? Is less money going into Scotland? Right? Because we are a business. Too often, we talk, when we talk about diversity, we are talking about headcount diversity, which uh, is you know, amorphous at best because you don't know where these positions are. We're not, you know, we're having strange metrics. In Scotland, it was really easy metrics. You know, so I oh, will was, yeah, look, I, look I, at my no, iPad I, when I need to. Okay. okay. <laughs> that's it. No, look, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. We have to talk about what we mean. And maybe that is one of the legacies is that we've had to do this more clearly and more properly. So we don't say the AME anymore, right? We know that's not... We, we talk less about diversity in general, right? So, for instance, when you were asking me what has actually happened as a result, part of it was these really detailed conversations, not simplistic conversations, a lot of them involving Marcus and others. Um, you know, Lucy's got an incredible um, history with Channel 4 as well. So, for instance... We, we, one of the things that we did was ensure that every genre in Channel 4 has a black-owned production company on their slate who they're working with. So to your point about, obviously, the importance of working with black-owned or Asian-owned companies, and that was one of the criticisms of our Black to Front project, was that there were not enough actual opportunities and programmes delivered by those companies, right? And that is something that we've absolutely taken on board. Equally, for instance, we announced 
£22 million worth of programming that was going to be spent by black and Asian-owned companies, okay? So that was one sort of thing, and there were lots of reasons why we got to that position. But what I'm trying to say is we've thought through this messy mulch and, and, and targeted particular things to particular things. Motion, we had a, we've got another fund, which is being looked after by my colleague Vivian Malocco, who's involved in Black's Front and is a commissioning editor at, at Channel 4. Yeah. And, um, but I'm just saying she is, uh, she, she's involved in this. Um, couldn't be here tonight. But um, she is running a fund, which is a multi-million pound fund, which is also black and Asian-led companies. So they're all slightly different things, but we've thought through what they are, and I absolutely agree it's really important to say what it means. And you were asking about other impacts. One of the things that I think is sort of when I was trying to say, not in a simplistic way and not, not acknowledging the nuance of it, is that, for instance, one of the most important changes we made after Black to Front was that we rewrote our commissioning guidelines. So those are the guidelines that we use when we commission a program. We're trying to launch a production. Who's staffing it? How are we measuring that? What are we doing? So we made the commitment that we would work with the production company that there has to be a senior figure, a senior figure, because the transformational thing we're trying to do, as we all agree, is not tr just training apprentices, junior members of teams to be black or Asian or whatever underrepresented group you want to talk about. We, had to, we said there had to be a senior person, right? And in that case, that does include minority ethnic and disabled, okay? But the point being that we have to have that conversation with the production company. Now, that is a really clear thing that we've done, but that change where every single production has a senior black person, for instance, in the team, is not gonna happen overnight. Because we've got that guideline and it's really important because it's really a quite concrete thing. But the sort of change in attitudes that has to come alongside with that is another thing that's going to take quite a long time to change. And I suppose that's just what I was getting at. There's the, there's the, there's the, there's this, there's this, it's not actually practical to literally force that overnight because we're trying to change. So I would, I would fundamentally with disagree. And the reason, and it's not fundamentally disagree in terms of just, you know, <laughs> what, out, of, out of the blue, right? 2007, the BBC pushed to Scotland, Wales, and all the... And they said that they said that over the X number of years, five years, we are going to have this number, this amount of commissioning spend in 2007, 2008, we're going to have this amount. To, and so they, what they did is they gave the likes of Banerjee, they gave the likes of all three media, three mental, fair notice as to what they were expecting. Right? That then gave... Uh, and Mentorn, that then gave those companies enough time, and enough time meaning like two or three years, right, to find Scottish talent, which they, which previous to that, they said wasn't there, right? And so it wasn't that it took years. And when I say previous, I'm I was agreeing in, with that. So I'm just saying, so I'm it just doesn't saying, take I'm a long saying, time. No, no, but okay. well, I'm, by it's not a long time, I mean not tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Right, so I'm just saying, right, like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. No, no, that's years. what I'm talking about. Oh, no, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm agreeing with Marcus, that. Marcus, I'm going to bring Joanna in, and I'm going to um, ask what you feel the value of targets within an, an organisation like the BBC is. So... Um, I was just thinking about this, and I, I just wanted to pick up on the point that Marcus has made, because he's made some really valid points. And I do think that the, in, in relation to the um, 112 million investment, very quickly into my interim role, um, I had a very unexpected <laughs> meeting with a number of indies that were owned by specifically black individuals. And they had questions around some of this, which was about, can you tell me specifically you know, what you're doing to work with us. And so that is a priority. I, I want to say that today. That is a big priority for us and the Credit Diversity team. And there's a new strategic plan for 2023 right through to 2027 in which we do drill down on the, at the actions and the things that we're committed to. So I'm going that way because I can see they're on my team members. But that we're committed to is drilling down into some of those questions that were raised. We also... And I also know that when I, when I joined the BBC, Miranda had already agreed that this, this uh, uh, commitment would always be reviewed, it would always be looked at, it would always be 
thought about again. It wasn't sort of, this is the criteria and that's it. It was always to have this, from my understanding, Miranda, that, that there would always be this review of, was it effective? What have we done? And can it, how do we develop or move that on? And um, we, we're going to be doing that with a number of external uh, organisations, including uh, the Lenny Henry Centre. So we're not sitting there saying that everything is absolutely perfect. perfect. It, has, it has done some things. It's shown us, as I said earlier, how we're spending, you know, and it has shown us how our, our um, indies are working with particular talent and in the interests of this particular conversation, black talent, um, whether they are at senior leadership or at the beginning of their careers. And it has also told us what our portrayal is looking like. So within our genres now, um, that our creative diversity partners can look and see how we are doing. So it, by no means were we saying, you know, that we've, we've created the answer to this, but what, we, what, what I believe it was, was as, as Marcus has, has, has mentioned, was this response, and it is going to constantly be developed. We've got, we obviously got to see it through. It's a three-year commitment. So as I say, it's, it's in the second year. We're going to look at that, and we're going to think about it. I think going forward, we can see, you know, like we care too about this subject matter within our creative diversity team, and we can see patterns. We're noticing, you know, who's being engaged with, who isn't being engaged with, and we're not just sitting there going, oh, that's all right, that's fine. Of course, we're looking at that and thinking, what can we do next? And we're asking others to say to us, this is what we're thinking. What do you think? Do you think that addresses some of these challenges? And luckily, I've had some brilliant people like Marcus... And, and, and other indies that have been really upfront and frank about where they think the shortcomings are. And, we, and the new plan, which we hope to share soon, well, the end of the summer, um, will go through lots of consultation before we get to a point where we talk about that. So I just think it's important to say that, that we are proud of what it's done, where it has done the things that we hoped it would, but we realise there is space for improvement. And Lucy, how does that make you feel? Well, it's very interesting because I think that sort of what you call fluidity is actually at the heart of the problem with the BBC because I think the lack of, it's what Marcus was saying, the lack of specificity means that you don't really know and you're right, maybe it's about, maybe it's about on-screen um, talent, maybe it's about indies, maybe it's about entry level and I think that, that what I see with the BBC is lots of good intention but if you're not measuring where those warm words are actually changing things it's very difficult, you know. Well, I think you'll be pleased to know <laughs> that in the new creative diversity plan, it's full of measurement. It's riddled in measurement. So, but, but, well, but, but I suppose, I mean, the, the, yeah, I mean, one of the things... No, I, I came up with that. That was, that was, yeah. our, that was our team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That you, you, you've got to remember, we're individuals that care about this subject. No, so, but there's so no, I'm, so, so no one sense is, that the people don't care. But, so, I mean, if we've been really clear. That's why I say we're drilling down. What do we need to improve on? And if we do this review and it turns out, as Marcus says, that there needs to be something more specific... Um, then we can look at that. that. And the whole plan, you'll see when it's published, for, for literally every part of it has a set of how we measure the success of that against audiences, against digital product, against across the UK. There's lots of strategies at play. But we, you'll see that when, when it comes. But um, I, I can't debate with you on something that was decided before I got there. <laughs> or no, like, no, all I can do now right. is look at what the commitment is, do my best to deliver that, review it, and then yeah. you know, create a plan that learned from that. I can't, I can't argue about what I've walked into. <laughs> We're just going to do this whole, let's, let's tease out the BBC to get it out of where it's at. But yes, the 112 came under my tenure. The aspiration, at that point, we had no baseline. We had no visibility of how much money we were spending on diverse on-screen representation. We had no idea about how much money we were spending with diverse production partners. We had no clue who our diverse production partners were. So in the absence of that, it was either let's take a couple more years and try and get that information, or should we just get a chunk of money and try and do the best that we can and use that as a springboard to be able to answer some of the questions that we had no visibility around? Is it perfect? God, no. Nothing out the gate is ever perfect. What you want to be able to do is have a framework that's flexible, that you can pivot, you can learn, you can grow. It sounds like Joanna has absolutely taken the ball by the horns and gone, there's obvious gaps. Absolutely. What Marcus isn't telling you is that we consulted with them and they surfaced a lot of things that needed to be looked at, but it was already in train. And so, but doing that consultation, making sure that we are being, I say we as in I'm still there, but you know what I mean, people. 
<laughs> Maybe. Um, so, by, but making sure that we are holding ourselves accountable. One of the things that I did before I left is I put an order in train. Yeah, so yeah. they even, and I'm so sorry, baby, I didn't know you were going to pick up the mantle. But it was to make sure that it didn't drop, we didn't drop the ball just because there was a new guard in town. So by making sure that, A, there was a starting point, and you could turn around and say 112 million isn't much. If that was sitting in my bank account, I would think it was much. But from the overall commissioning spend, it is literally a drop in the ocean, but it's a drop in the ocean we never had before. And it has complexities that make it difficult to see the nuance of the black-owned narrative and story. But as Mark has said, quite a lot of us morphed from black to diversity, to a number of things. And so, like I said, to get us on the step to trying to make a difference, where we've been talking about this for 30 years with all good intention and very little impact. You see, I think this is the really sort of sleight of BBC sleight of hand, which is you say 100 million, but we don't know what that means. On and board. anyway, you know, we, we don't know. So I'm not, I'm not saying that, that, that yeah, it's no, no, I hear not you. the good intentions, but I think, you know... Probably what happens is that you say 100 million and everyone goes, gosh, that's a lot. But then you say, well, what's it going to be spent on? We say, well, we don't quite know yet. And what was it spent on? Well, we don't quite know yet. And oh, but I think no, it would do, because there's a report. Well, there was criteria. <laughs> yeah. there, it wasn't yes, like that. It wasn't quite, there it, was it criteria. Wasn't, but I would take issue with Miranda saying that we hadn't had the 112 million before. Because if you actually look at the criteria, if you include socioeconomic diversity, mm -hmm. which is in there, it right, it's, It could be argued, now I know that you have excluded it, mm -hmm. or the BBC, not you, the BBC excluded it, but it could be argued that EastEnders, right, mm -hmm. through socioeconomic diversity, right, fits that criteria for on-screen and for production spend behind the camera. Yeah. Right? Now, it just so happens that EastEnders is roughly £32 million a year. Mm -hmm. right? That would eat up it would. You're 32 million. That's why we didn't include them. Right. So, but it, it then messes with your baseline. So, just to be accurate, you did actually have programs which fitted your criteria for your, hun for your 100 million. Now, it, it becomes, to answer, to, to speak to Lucy's point, it then becomes even more muddled, right? Because should we count EastEnders as a diverse program, mm -hmm. right? Because in Scotland... And I keep going back to Scotland, that's because that's where I worked for eight years. But in Scotland, there was no muddle, right? It was either a Scottish programme or if it wasn't a Scottish programme. It wasn't like, oh, well, that programme, that's going to eat up too much of the budget. That would be a bit confusing. We'll just ex exclude that. Or that programme wasn't quite made in Scotland. But you know what? There are a lot of <laughs> Scottish people who, who made it, even though it was actually south of the border. But, you know, we'll, we'll include that. No muddle. Mm -hmm. Looked at all the programmes that fit the criteria and said, this is the spend. Done. So, to speak to Lucy's point, all, all independent production companies are asking for is clarity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm. And so, if you find out that if you include... I, I wouldn't have taken out EastEnders and say, you know what, the actual spend is, 100, is 200 million, because if you... over three years. Because if you include EastEnders... But the 112 million doesn't include any of continuing drama. But, uh, but I, would, I would argue, right, that there's not an Indian here who doesn't want a continuing drama, right? <laughs> if you look at continuing drama, yeah. if, we, if we want to actually grow directors, yes. yeah. if we want to grow script writers, if we want to grow actors, we need to include and diversify continuing dramas. BBC Scotland has got a continuing drama, right, which then feeds the rest of the production within Scotland and the dramas which are made. And it's mm -hmm. really important that the Scottish spend goes on the continuing drama which is in Scotland. Okay, and I okay. can see that the series producer of EastEnders wants ex former wants to actually come in here on continuing dramas. <laughs> yeah. Age, but way back in time, <laughs> yes, a little bit back in time, when I started on EastEnders. Let's say that this is Barbara Emile speaking, former. Oh, yes, the great Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> you lot, I'm going to go away and fight now. All right, when I first started on EastEnders, diversity was me, the cleaners, and security. And that's literal. The first um, meeting I went to, 
There are 40 of us in a room, creative meeting, one of the leading writers, his statement on a black character was, he's a nigger in the wood park. Wow. <gasps> That's a fact, everyone. That's fact. And I sat there and I didn't know what to do or say. But I made a decision then that if I can influence change, I would. About 18 months later, I started running the show. And at that point, but even as a producer, I said, OK, we've got to create the characters that have longevity. I, we have to find 50% of all directors must be women. They were 15% when I took over. Uh, when I left, it was 50% said in terms of production, at least a third need to be diverse. That included economic, um, di sadly disability, I didn't quite manage, but in terms of diversity, a third was. One of the highest rated episodes was directed by a black woman, Jo Johnson. Um, it was written by a black um, writer. It was you may be sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was producing at the time. My point is, in terms of writers and directors, that was the most important thing. I was very naughty. shouldn't really say this, but I decided, as we all do, um, if we will come in on time, on budget, below budget. No one was interested particularly, Alan Yentov, bless you, you weren't interested. So I could just get on with it. So we ring-fenced money. It was not just me, it was a team who were committed. And with that ring-fenced money, all the directors that came in who hadn't done, you know, kind of uh, that sort of show before, it was a shadow scheme with purpose. I never do anything without purpose. So the first shadow scheme was literally shadowing directors so that they learnt the, um, how the show worked. As far as I'm concerned, if you're a talented director, you're a talented director. I don't need to tell you how to direct. Mm. All you need to know is how the flipping thing worked. Okay, and so then they shadowed, and then you were, you were employed. You shot several episodes. In terms of writers, we set up a writer's scheme where, again, we found new writers. We had A, B, C, and D. I said to all the A-list writers, I know you're going to leave and go off and do something very exciting. Before you go, will you help me? Oh. Will you make the difference? Yes, so you will mentor the D, who are completely new, and you will, they mentored them into their careers beyond that. And basically, everybody was paid, everybody came and pitched their ideas. They were paid exactly the same amount of money, so that the new writers felt valued, because it wasn't about... Do you have talent? Yes, you damn well do. All you need to know is how the show runs. Um, when I left, the writer scheme continued, um, and a third of the writers were diverse. I have to say this with no disrespect, and this isn't a boast for me, you know, because it was a team. It was everybody um, who were working together, and those who didn't want to do it, had to get rid of them. But anyway, um, the main point was it didn't take more than six months to change that show. Mm. It doesn't need the training. It doesn't need lots and lots of research. It needs commitment mm -hmm. and to start from a position where there is talent out there. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. We have now entered the audience contribution part of the evening, and we have about five to ten minutes. So if anyone has a brief question, <laughs> I will take three, and I will take the first question from a woman. So we will, we will start with you, then we'll go to you, and then we will do another round. Okay? Yeah? Yeah? Um, my name is Dominique, aka Variety Dean. I'm a stand up comedian, not just a comedian, but a pioneer, the first black British disabled comic in my era. And um, it is quite lonely. There are some fun parts, that me being here for one. And um, it's been very tricky. I've only recently been signed, I've been doing comedy for 16 years, I'll be 32 next month, I'm getting on. So, um, what I want to do is expand and try and do that documentary based upon being black and disabled and being a comic. There's no representation like that in the UK. 
Um, I have never seen it and I've come across it. Literally, I feel like I'm the only one that is confused. And I do try to like um, say what, what I want to do and create. It feels like it's going to get stolen. Um, that someone's going to take it and then just run away with it. And I get the world to just run So tell me, uh, who do I trust, who do I go to, who do I get consultation with? Um, cause I, was, I was meant to. Here's my thing. Now I was meant to meet um, you with some. Miranda. Thank you. Um, I don't know who you first name. Um, <laughs> a few years back, um, thanks to Jean Sopol, but I had a brain operation mm-hmm. and I needed that. So mm-hmm. now I'm alive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to use I want to use work on a variety of things, hence the name variety, because I want to try to document you based on you know black women and. Um, black British families, you know, in the spotlight. We know white ones in Britain, and America got their own thing. The NAACP, they got Jackson and stuff. Mm-hmm. But we don't have our own thing here. Okay, because so we, we've got can, a really write, short time me. for because we've got a really short time. You, you can you can email me. It's on our website, or you can get it after. Okay, we've got a really short time for all audience yeah, we'll, questions uh, left, but a question we'll broadly around like intersectionality, pathways to pitching, uh, is the first question. The second question. Carol Harding, producer. I joined like Barbara. In fact, Barbara took me back to drama. I started as a programme trainee in 19, eight, late second half of the 80s. And what I would say is, is that I really, really, really only want to know three things. How much money is being spent? Who's commissioning it? And how can we make sure there are enough commissioning it who have the point of view of people like me and which companies are being commissioned and I think that if that was made transparent everything else would change just what is the commissioning budget who is commissioning it and which Indies are getting the money and which internal departments and executives are getting the money because if you can have that information Things will naturally change when things are transparent. And are you referring to the 112 million, I'm assuming? No, I'm talking about the whole. Oh, thing. all of us. We have a brief can I response. Last, can I get the last point? You said who? Right. What, so what budget. Who uh, what is the budget? Who is commissioning? To spend that money. Yeah. And who is getting that money? Mm-hmm. Because if all those things were made transparent, things would naturally change because you would change the commissioning structure. Mm-hmm. I think. The idea of point of view is really important to me. Mm-hmm. And my point of view of the world is different to the next person's point of view. And it encompasses everybody. I think that I could, I've worked in single drama film, continuing drama. And I think the lifeblood of independent companies and of broadcasters is returning series. Mm-hmm. And for companies to survive, they need to be able to be given that money to build the talent to have returning series, single dramas, feature films within their company. So the breakdown of where that money is going, who's commissioning it and who's getting it, is the thing we all need to ask for. Okay, if we can get a brief response from the panel to those two questions, then I can do one more round of just questions and brief responses to those questions. So, a brief response to those two questions, please, from whoever. Um, with regards to intersectionality, Channel 4 are the only people that have um, even attempting to measure intersectionality. They came to Lenny Henry Center and we gave them advice on how, to, on how to do that. And I would advise BBC, Amazon, if you want to know how to do intersectionality um, and measure it and set targets, come to us or even look at the paper which is um, in public that we did for Channel 4. So I think intersectionality is really important. It's not measured enough. With regards to the budget total, um, the, literally the only time that I've ever um, crossed swords with Miranda in public, in private, yeah. any time, yeah, yeah. That was, very yeah. true. Was, um, <laughs> was when she was trying to explain, this was the Edinburgh Television Festival, and she was trying to explain whether it was ring-fenced money mm. or not ring-fenced money, and I, feel, mm. I still sympathise for you <laughs> because you got yourself in such a muddle <laughs> trying to explain whether it was ring-fenced money or not ring-fenced money. Hearing um, Joanna talk about it as a, more as an accountancy tool as to actually measuring what is being spent, I think is incredibly useful 
and I think is a step forward with regards to tr transparency and honesty with regards to the BBC, and hopefully that will give some budget questions as to what is the total budget which is actually being spent on black productions or other types of productions. Right. Who is commissioning? People can look that up, and there are black mm. commissioners, there are other kinds of commissioners, and there are commissioning schemes, and there's def every broadcaster is committed to having more commissioners, and you know, there are targets for that. Who gets commissions? Um, you know, there are people in here who are getting those, those commissions, um, but there definitely can be more transparency. I definitely hear, with regards to the point that you make with regards to returnable series, it is the only way, right, other that it is the lifeblood, returnable series is the only way that um, black-led indies can actually um, economically and financially survive, or else all you're having to do is reinvent the wheel every single time. So we, and we're, again, looking at regional diversity, when the BBC and Channel 4 went out to the nations and regions, it realised it had to place returnable series. And so it placed Mastermind, it placed um, Eggheads, Songs it of placed... Praise. Um, which one? Songs of Praise. Songs of Praise. It placed um, Waterloo Road, which then died, but that's another point. But it, but it realised that the only way that you... Uh, question time. The only way that you can actually have a sustainable yeah. sector is if there's returnable series. And there are far too few returnable series that um, black-led indies or Asian-led indies or disabled-led indies are getting. And it's just not economically viable. But Lucy will be able to talk to that far better than I can. Yeah, I mean, I, and I, th I think that, that this is what I'm saying about, I think, I think the BBC, they, they, certainly with black indies, they set a lots of hairs, hairs racing. They have this thing called the small indie scheme. And they were sort of boasting last year about having invested in like a hundred companies and it's like the, you know broadcasting cannot support a hundred growing companies so it sort of I think slightly cynically knows that those companies are going to fail because you can't support that many but actually you know putting you know more behind people with the potential for growth I think that's something that you don't see in black companies. And, and, and as Marcus says, you do see it in, in regionality. You don't see it in disability. But th that idea that actually, if, you're go if you really want to change things, you've got to go where the money is. I mean, that EastEnders example was classic. You know, where is the black company equivalent to the EastEnders production office? You know, because if you haven't got you know, what Barbara had, which is a budget and a team and the ability to, to, to actually change things, you can't do it. You can't do it with, you know, small um, projects that you have to sort of go out with your begging bowl every six months to get another one. So I think, I think what Barbara's saying is really profound because it's like, where, you know, without in-house, how is that happening out of house and how is that being supported? I'm going to take one more question from the audience. We, you had your hand up at the start, so. A question only, please. The RTS doesn't allow you to be offensive. It makes it difficult to uh, construct a question about <laughs> Ofcom. <laughs> but I'd like to ask a question about Ofcom. The death of George Floyd was an extreme expression of racism. It was not unique, and it was not unique to America. But there are people working in broadcasting who suffer less extreme expressions of racism. Some of them come to me. Racism and bullying and sexual harassment flourish in secrecy. Now, I was amazed in January when I raised a question about what Ofcom was doing about racism. Uh, that Vicky Cook, Ofcom's head of EDI, said, oh, yesterday, this was on the 25th of January, we had a meeting with 40 people about racism, but no one's allowed to say what was said in the meeting. Now, I know some of the panel were in the meeting, and I don't want them excommunicated by Ofcom, so I'm not going to ask them <laughs> what was said in the meeting, but my question is this. <laughs> It's three months ago. Is any positive action coming out of that meeting? What needs to be done? And what does Ofcom need to do? Who would like to answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I you can't, that I can't remember? remember because I've been to a couple of Ofcom I, meetings. I was, I was at, I was at that, that specific meeting that I think Vicky Cook was referring to. Um, Joanna um, briefly appeared on Zoom along with Michelle and then disappeared because you had another BBC representative there. So BBC was represented. Um, so I don't think that they can speak to it because they weren't at the meeting. Mm -hmm. Lucy was not at the meeting. Shaminda was not at the meeting. I can take your question. All right. <laughs> um, so, Ofcom held the meeting under what they said it was um, Chatham House rules. Um, it, it wasn't because Chatham House rules is non-attribution. It was what I would like to call Las Vegas rules, which is, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? Um, and, uh, and so I can't really talk about it. What I can say, and what is public, is that it was convened due to Bechtu saying that they needed to be work on the independent race and reporting body, and there was no pushback from any of the, all the other um, entertainment unions were there. They all supported the idea of an independent race and reporting body, and there was no pushback from any of the broadcasters and streamers that, that were there for the idea and principle of an independent race and reporting body. There is problems with regards to how that would be funded. Okay. I would like to thank the RTS. I'd like to thank um, Angela. I would uh, like to apologise to the Cavendish Conference Centre for slightly overrunning. I also want to um, ask one final question to every panel member with one sentence, which is, in UK broadcasting, what will be the single greatest legacy of the Black Square by the fifth anniversary of George Floyd's murder in 2025? One sentence will start with Miranda. Okay. UK, uh, I think the biggest success that we could see is some of the questions that we've had mm -hmm. today and some of the discussions that we've had. We have moved on from that. And actually, we've addressed some of that. So the fantastic work that Channel 4 have done, I would like to see that amplified across all of the streamers and broadcasters. I guess that's my simplest answer. I would like to go to the old sort of TV industry award ceremony and not be one of only a handful of people who weren't white mm. there. Um, and that's not, a, that's not a trivial point. It's just a point I'm trying to make really about just who we work with in making TV programs. The point at which it doesn't feel unusual to be with other people like most of us here. Mm. Um, that would feel like we'd moved quite a long way. Um, ring fence funds. So... Um, since um, the death of George Floyd, um, the conversation has moved on. And even though the ring, Channel 4 has got ring fence funds, ITV have got ring fence funds, BBC have got ring fendish funds, right? And so, but the, but the principle of the idea there could be ring fence funds for diverse black films is an argument which hadn't been won prior to George Floyd and is an argument which has been won now. We just need to make sure that it's implemented properly. Some people are doing it better than others. I'd like to see diversity, um, uh, racial diversity, uh, treated, taken as seriously as regionality. I think that we need to just embed it in broadcasting uh, permanently, not every now and then, but it needs to be an absolutely permanent feature of, of how we broadcast to the nation. And Joanna? Um, I would say uh, much of what I've heard from colleagues today, but I guess um, yeah, an increase in off-screen black <coughs> talent uh, who are in, and by that I mean specifically you know, black-owned indies, being able to make <coughs> programmes, whether it's for radio or for television, and a huge, an increase in that, an increase in the seniority of black individuals that are on production teams, I think is really important. I think the nuanced portrayal with a consideration of its impact and the authenticity, just to Miranda's point earlier, we see a lot of stories that may feel authentic, but sometimes it's the same story, so that variety, so we can look at the impact of that. And then I just wrote here, more detail, more transparency, and more impact measurement. Thanks, everyone.